you'll never have job stability again. AI is making sure of that. You'll either be relearning new jobs forever, or you'll have your job completely taken by AI. Let's see which might happen to you. Hey, I'm Theodore and welcome to ASD, where we break down the future of work. Today, we're diving into how AI is reshaping the workplace and why lifelong learning is no longer a choice, but a necessity. Gwen and Charlie are here to guide you through what's at stake, including all the jobs AI will take forever. But there might be a silver lining in the end where no one has to work. Let's find out. All right, so you guys sent over a bunch of articles all about AI and the future of jobs. And honestly, it's a lot to unpack. Some of it's pretty intense, like Elon Musk's predictions. Yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah. So basically, you want to know what's the signal in all this noise? Are the robots actually going to take our jobs or is there more to it? Well, it's interesting how much this whole thing rhymes with history. You know, the fear that machines will come for people's work. It's not exactly new. We've seen this same pattern again and again. I get that. It's almost like a cliched sci-fi plot, but now it's happening for real. Right. Like in that article about Elon Musk's vision of an AI-dominated future, it even brought up the Luddites, those textile workers who literally smashed up the machines back in the 19th century. Oh, oh yeah, totally. They were not happy campers. Not even a little. And honestly, I kind of get it. If I saw my livelihood being threatened by some newfangled contraption, I don't know if I'd be too thrilled either. But it does make you wonder, is AI really that different from those mechanical looms that the Luddites were so freaked out about? Or is this time around truly different? It's a big question. And, you know, to answer it, we kind of got to look back at how accurate those old predictions about the future of work actually were. OK, so like what did the crystal ball say back in the day? Well, in the 1960s. It was all sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. Everyone thought we'd be working like 30 hour weeks max, kicking back by the pool with all this free time. Turns out that didn't pan out so well. Yeah, tell me about it 30 hours a week. Now that's what I call science fiction. Right. And then you have the total opposite, like the Global 2000 report from the 1980s. Yeah. They predicted a new ice age mass starvation. Yeah. And not exactly the most accurate predictions. It makes you wonder how much we can really trust any of these forecasts, right? Exactly. It's so tempting to think, oh, AI is either going to be a utopia or a dystopia. But it's probably way more complicated than that. So you're saying there's still hope for us humans after all? Maybe the robots aren't coming for our jobs just yet. Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. The thing about AI is it's awesome at certain things, especially stuff that's like rule-based and repetitive. Yeah. But it really struggles with the things that make us human, yeah. you know? Like creativity, emotional intelligence, that kind of stuff. Okay, that's good news for those of us who still haven't mastered the art of coding or talking to robots. So which jobs should we be worried about and which ones are safe, for now at least? Yeah, so that article, What Jobs Will AI Replace, had some good examples. Things like data entry, customer service, even some, some types of coding. Those are definitely at risk. We're already seeing chatbots handling customer queries and self-driving trucks. You know? Wow, it's amazing and kind of scary at the same time. So if AI is coming for the repetitive jobs, what does that mean for the rest of us? What are the jobs of the future? That's where those human skills come in. Think of jobs that need a lot of empathy, deep communication, that ability to build trust. Those are tougher for AI to crack, at least for now. Mm. So like teachers, therapists, nurses, social workers, those kinds of roles. It's like those professions need a level of emotional depth and understanding that AI just can't replicate. At least not in any meaningful way. It's not just about following a script or crunching numbers. It's about connecting with another human being on an emotional level. Exactly. And it's not just those traditionally human-centric jobs either. That same article talked about how much we still value creativity and originality. Sure, AI can generate text or music, even art, but it's basically just remixing old stuff. Mm. Real creativity, you know, that spark of something new that's still uniquely human. So mm. artists, writers, musicians, those are the folks who are going to be harder to replace. So it's not about fearing the robot takeover. It's about understanding how these skills are shifting. It's less about competing with AI and more about figuring out where we excel as humans and using those strengths to thrive in this changing job market. You got it. It's about adapting alongside technology, not freaking out about it. All right. So AI is shaking things up. 
but it's not necessarily the end of the world as we know it. But what can we actually do to get ready? How do we make sure we don't get left behind? It's more than just learning a new software or brushing up on your coding skills. It's about this idea of continuous learning, you know, always be learning. The jobs of tomorrow might not even exist yet. So we got to be curious, adaptable and hungry to learn new things. It's like becoming a learning machine ourselves, always adapting and evolving to keep up. That's the idea. And it's great to see companies like Amazon taking the lead with that upskilling 2025 program. They're investing a ton of money in retraining their workforce. They get it. Their employees' ability to learn and adapt is make or break for them. Right. It's like they're saying, hey, we're all in this together. Let's make sure our team has the skills to crush it in this new world. Mm -hmm. It's not just Amazon either. AT&T has that future ready initiative. It's really encouraging to see companies putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to investing in their employees' future. It shows how important this is. And it's not just about companies taking the lead. It's about each of us taking charge of our own careers, asking ourselves, what are my strengths? How can I build on them, stay curious, and roll with the punches? It's like we're all CEOs of our own careers now. we got to be proactive and see change as an opportunity, not a threat. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're going to dig into in our next segment. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the potential downsides of AI, you know, disrupting the job market and all that. But I'm curious, is there another side to this coin? Are there any potential upsides to this whole AI revolution? Oh, absolutely. It's easy to get caught up in all the doom and gloom. But those articles you sent actually highlight some pretty exciting opportunities, too. Okay, I like that. So tell me more. What's got you feeling optimistic? Well, for starters, remember that article about hybrid work trends? It talked about how the pandemic really sped up a lot of changes that were already happening, like the whole remote work thing, flexible schedule. Oh, yeah, the great remote work experiment. Right. And it seems like for a lot of people, that flexibility isn't just a perk anymore. It's a necessity. Totally. And what's interesting is even with some companies trying to drag everyone back to the office, it seems like hybrid work is here to stay. It's a top priority for employees. And a lot of businesses are finally realizing that, hey, it can actually be good for them, too. You know, increased productivity, lower costs, access to a wider talent pool. So more flexibility, more control over our schedules, potentially a better work-life balance. Those are definitely some major perks. But what about the work itself? Is AI going to turn us all into like spreadsheet crunching robots, even if those robots do get to work from home in their pajamas? Not necessarily. That Nine Trends That Will Shape Work article brought up this really interesting concept they call the cost of work. It's not just about the salary anymore. People are thinking about the time, the energy, even the actual money they spend just getting to and from work. It's like they're saying, my time and well-being are valuable and I'm not going to sacrifice them for a job that doesn't get that. Exactly. And employers are starting to pick up on this. The article mentioned companies trying out some pretty creative benefits to offset these costs, like housing subsidies, help with childcare, even student loan assistance. They're starting to address the real-life stuff that today's workers are dealing with. Wow. It's like the whole idea of a job is changing. It's not just about clocking in and out anymore. It's about finding something that fits into your life and your values. And speaking of redefining work, that same article also talked about this growing interest in four-day work weeks. Wait a minute. Four-day work weeks? That sounds kind of like a utopian dream. Is that even realistic on a large scale? It might sound crazy, yeah. but it's gaining some serious traction. Some companies are already giving it a shot, and the results are pretty impressive. Higher productivity, happier employees, even a smaller environmental impact. It's like a win-win-win. I can see why people are into it, but I have to ask, how do you actually make it work? I mean, cramming five days of work into four, doesn't that just mean longer hours and more pressure to always be on? It's not about just squeezing everything into fewer days. It's about rethinking how we work all together. Yeah. It's about getting rid of pointless meetings, streamlining processes, and giving people the freedom to focus and be more productive during those four days. So less busy work, more efficiency and intentionality. I like it. Exactly. And this actually ties into another big trend that came up in a few of the articles, skills-based hiring. 
more and more companies are ditching the whole resume thing and focusing on what people can actually do. You know, their skills and abilities, not just their degrees or their past job titles. It makes sense. I mean, a piece of paper doesn't always tell the whole story about someone's abilities. Totally. And that upskilling and reskilling article talked about how careers are becoming way less linear these days. People are switching careers all the time, learning new skills, constantly reinventing themselves. It's less about climbing the corporate ladder and more about navigating this like dynamic jungle gym of opportunities. Love that analogy. It really captures the whole adapt or die vibe of the current job market. Right. So what employers really want now are people who are adaptable, quick learners, problem solvers, good communicators. Yeah. And of course, those uniquely human skills we talked about before, empathy, communication, critical thinking. Yeah. As AI takes over more routine stuff, those skills are only going to become even more valuable. Okay, so it's about being a jack of all trades, a master of adaptation, and never losing sight of those core human skills that make us who we are. Wow, it's a lot to take in. It is, but it's also pretty exciting. I mean, the future of work isn't set in stone. We're shaping it right now with the choices we make, the skills we develop, the attitudes we embrace. It's almost like we're pioneers in this uncharted territory, figuring out the rules as we go. But there's still one big question looming. What happens to the people whose jobs are most vulnerable to automation in this brave new world of work? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? We've talked about all these exciting possibilities, but we can't ignore the people whose jobs are most likely to be automated. What happens to them in all of this? It's the big elephant in the room for sure. That jobs lost, jobs gained. That article didn't shy away from it either. It basically said that while AI will definitely create new jobs, it's not going to be this one-to-one -one trade off. The whole nature of work is changing and some people are going to feel it more than others. Yeah, it's like that saying, when one door closes, another one opens. But what if you don't even know where that other door is? What if all your skills suddenly become irrelevant? It's a real concern. Yeah. And it shows how important it is to get ahead of this curve. That same article talked about the risk of income inequality, basically where the high-skill, high-paying jobs keep growing, while those middle-income jobs, the ones that are easier to automate, they start disappearing. And AI could make that whole thing even worse if we don't do something. Right. So it's not just about how many jobs there are. It's about what kind of jobs and whether people can actually get them. It's like we need a whole system upgrade. So what are some potential solutions? What can we do? That article is a world with no work possible. It had some pretty radical ideas. It argued that we need to rethink the whole social contract like how we value work and how we create opportunities for people to contribute, even if there are fewer traditional jobs to go around. OK, that sounds like a pretty big shift. So what does that look like in the real world? Well, one idea is that universal basic income thing, you know, giving everyone a safety net. Yeah. Regardless of whether they have a job. But it's not just about handing out money. The article stressed the need for massive investment in education and retraining programs so people can actually thrive in this new world of work. Makes sense. We got to prepare people for the jobs of the future, not the jobs of the past. But let's be honest, our current education system isn't exactly known for being super adaptable or quick to change. No argument there. Yeah. It's a huge challenge. But there are some positive signs. Like we were saying before, companies like Amazon and AT&T are pouring money into upskilling their workforce. Mm. Imagine if government stepped up and made that kind of retraining accessible and affordable for everyone. It would be a game changer. It's about recognizing that investing in people is not just the right thing to do, but it's also good for the economy as a whole. Exactly. And it's not all about technical skills either. That article also talked about the social and psychological benefits of work. Yeah. You know, that sense of purpose of being part of something, of contributing. If traditional jobs are changing, we need to find new ways for people to experience that fulfillment. Absolutely. It's about finding meaning and connection in a world where the boundaries of work are blurring. It's about realizing that a good life is about more than just a paycheck. It's about community creativity learning. It's about defining success on your own terms. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, this has been quite a deep dive. We've covered a lot of ground, and it's clear that the future of work is full of unknowns. But hey, at least we're asking the right questions, right? Definitely. And that's half the battle, I think. Yeah. The key is to stay informed stay curious, and stay adaptable. To wrap things up, is there one big takeaway you would leave our listeners with? Embrace change. Don't be afraid of it. See it as a chance to learn and grow. The future is ours to create. Love that. Yeah. So to all our listeners out there, stay curious, stay engaged, and never stop learning. The future of work is happening right now, and it's up to all of us to shape it for the better. like subscribe
subscribe and share this with someone who hates going to work. Well, we heard that jobs are already being taken by AI, but we want to know someone who it has actually happened to. Comment and share your story if you or someone you know lost their job to AI. Maybe if we share, we can get the government to do something about it. That's it for today, Cosmic Travelers. I'll leave you to ponder what a future with no jobs would be like.